will say um, it's good to be back with my church family. And Debbie said this morning, she said, I don't like being away from our church family for so long. Uh, kind of lets the air out of your tires, right? But uh, we energize each other and it's good. I'll be glad when all the vacation time is, is done and we're all back in place, get ready to hit the road because uh, August is going to be a very busy time. We have a lot planned for August. We want you to be involved uh, in it, one of the uh, events, a large event that's coming up, and I wanted to start off asking uh, this question to you. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but is there someone in here or several in here who have prayed that prayer at the end of the service with me as I've led you through the sinner's prayer, the, um, um, able to uh, pray and ask Jesus to come into your life? How many of you have prayed that prayer with me at the end of the service? And now you're wondering, what's the next step? What do I do next? Or you've been a Christian for a while and you've come in here and you're like, I need to know what track I need to run on. Well, let me tell you the next step, and it is your baptism. Making a public profession of your faith, uh, an outward sign of an inward change. Well, we're going to have one more uh, uh, outdoor baptism at our family cookout uh, in, on the 18th at uh, the Walker's Pond. And uh, we're getting that pond all cleaned up for you, but there are several who are going to be baptized. And if you have not been baptized by immersion, uh, being placed under the water uh, as a biblical, uh, biblical mandate, I want to invite you to uh, let us know. Call the church office or talk to one of the staff members today, and we'll get you signed up. But that's always an exciting event. But the, we, we want everyone to be there. It's a wonderful time of fellowship, and we have an opportunity to be able to visit with each other and possibly make some new friends and good barbecue too. So we'll have... We'll have fun. Over the past several weeks, you have been in good hands with our uh, staff preaching. Don't we have a wonderful staff? Amen. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. And they stepped up. We have gone through, we're going through the um, book of Ephesians, and every one of them have stepped up with that scripture, different insights uh, to this truth in Ephesians. But we have just a, I'm so proud of the staff. I watched and I thought, man, these um, we're, not, we're not doing without, and so it was so good. But we're going to be looking at a passage today starting in Ephesians chapter 5, and, uh, and it's going to be one of those uh, passages that we've landed on that is going to require some self, self-evaluation. I think it's going to, some part of this is going to hit home with each and every one of us. And so I want to ask that you would open your mind, that you'd open your Bibles, if you brought your Bibles with you, that you would take some notes today, but that you would receive the, don't, let's not just be uh, hearers of the word, but let's do, be doers of the word as well. And if you see some change that needs to take place in your life, um, some repentance, some, um, some confession of sin in your life, then uh, do it, just do it and uh, get a fresh new start as we as we move through here today. But we'll start off in Ephesians chapter one, uh, chapter five, verse one. But let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your word, I'm gonna ask that you would open our hearts. I wanna ask, Heavenly Father, that you would speak to us, that your Holy Spirit, we've invited you here, we have sung that, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And for you to be here and for us to be open to you, our lives couldn't possibly be the same after your word is spoken. And we pray that you would make this so obvious to us. I pray that you'd use me to speak to your people. We want to, we want to hear your voice. I bind the enemy, Satan, and any demonic spirit from this place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we would not be distracted by anything on the outside, but that we'd hear what you have to say to us on the inside. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've gone through Ephesians, uh, this series, we've discussed the mind of the new man, the person who is a new creation in Christ Jesus. When we invite Jesus to come into our life, we are a new creation. And then the behavior of the new man or woman, as we're a new creation, there's a change in our behavior. Uh, we're changing the way we think. And then there's the admonitions for the new man or the new woman as a new creation in Christ Jesus. But we come to chapter 5 where Paul sums, sums it all up by saying in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, be, imitator, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Now, that word therefore is a, is a very important transitional word. Anytime you're studying the word of God and you see that word therefore, you better go back and find out what it's talking about, what it's there for, uh, what that word is there for and what it's connecting uh, as, you, as you proceed in your study. So in this verse, the, uh, the therefore refers back to an extremely challenging concept 
and we look back at, verse, at chapter 4, verse 32, and he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ Christ God, uh, Christ God forgave you. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. So that's an intentional and ongoing challenge for the child of God, that we'd be imitators of God, that we would imitate his personality, that we would try to imitate his character. And um, we see a child, uh, when, if any of you have had children, well, you see children trying to imitate their parents. You see that little boy sitting behind the steering wheel in the car, a parked car, and he's pretending like he's driving like mom and dad. Or you see that little boy standing up on the toilet seat, looking in the mirror with his dad, pretending, pretending like he's shaking. Shaving, or you see the little girl who's in the kitchen, she's uh, making a cake with her mom, pretending to be like her mom, or washing dishes, or making, making, uh, making dinner. So we want to imitate our children, imitate us, and that can be encouraging, but at sometimes it can be embarrassing as well uh, for them to imitate what they see at home. For example, uh, you know, that, that's usually, it's usually pleasant to watch. However, that tendency may sometimes reveal some things that we really don't want other people to see, some family, family secrets. But your children are watching you, and they're picking up on your opinions, your, your ideas, your actions, your attitudes. And that's what he's talking about here as far as us being imitators of God that we'd have that same attitude, that we should try to imitate our Heavenly Father. And if we're going to be kind and compassionate and forgiving, then we're going to try to imitate what we have experienced from God, what, he, what we have experienced in him doing in and through our life. How much of the forgiveness have you experienced, the compassion, the, the kindness, the mercy, and the grace as he poured out on your life? Well, that's, that's the model for us. And that's what we are trying to imitate as children of God. So to do that, there has to be two fundamental focused priorities. Number one is we have to practice Christ's love. And we see that in verse 2 as he says, And live a life of love just as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then I always go back to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 16, verses 13 and 14, where we're to be soldiers of the cross. We're to be strong and bold and courageous, where he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men and, cur- men and women of courage, be strong. But then in verse 14, he sums it up and says, but do it in love. But do everything in love. Everything that we do is done in love, and that's the imitation of Christ. So there are two divine traits to God's love. One is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the hallmark of the Christian faith, and that's a challenge for some who have not cut it loose, cut some of these things loose and forgiven and moved on with their life. It all starts back with the amazing, incredible forgiveness that we have experienced from God in our lives, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again. And you think of Peter saying, how often should I forgive? And Jesus says 70 times seven. In other words, how many times have I forgiven you for the same thing? For the same thing over and over again. You come to me over and over again and you ask forgiveness and I forgive you when you are repentant when you want to turn your life around and you are repentant. And that same quality of forgiveness is what we as as children of God want to imitate and extend to other people. Our unforgiving spirit is a foothold for the devil, and he loves it when you won't do it. You think of that person that you have a hard time, time forgiving, and if he can get you in that grip of unforgiveness, then he's going to strip a lot of the joy out of your life. He's going to corrode your ability to be able to be able to love. You know, when somebody hurts you or offends you or violates you and you refuse to forgive, there's one person that is going to suffer the most, and that's you. It's you. The other person may not even know that there's a problem. They've gone on with their life, but you're carrying this around and it's corroding your life, corroding your ability to love. If you can't cut it loose, you're the one who pays the price and you're denying or at least disregarding the forgiveness that God has shown to you. So it's always to your best interest to forgive. It's the mark of a child of God and it's a key to maintaining your spiritual, emotional, 
and physical well-being to forgive, let it go, cut the barbs loose. Some of you have been violated in some severe ways. Some of you have been have experienced betrayal or hurt, a tremendous hurt, a broken heart in some way, but you've got to go on with your life. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. You've got to go on, cut it loose. Don't pull that bar, don't pull that garbage along with you, but cut it loose. Second divine trait of God's love is sacrifice. You know, God's love is more than just pity and compassion and mercy and tenderness, but it's a love that's unconditional. It's a love that gives all. And Jesus, there on the cross of Calvary, gave his life. It was a fragrant offering of, or sacrifice that, that he gave to God. He gave, he gave his all, and that's the ultimate love, and that's the love that we are to imitate as the children of God. That's the kind of love that we want to have, where we give our lives away. We sacrifice our lives for the well-being of others. Philippians chapter 2, going back to Philippians in uh, chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Well, the Lord Jesus pleased the Father by giving of himself. He gave his all, and this was a sacrificial fragrant offering to the Father, and so it is with us. The moral is that we too bring joy to God by giving of ourselves, considering others to be more important than ourselves. Considering others to be more important than ourselves. To give of ourselves, to give our lives away. It's when we give our lives away that we find our life. And so the first fundamental focused priority in imitating God is to practice Christ's love. Then the second is to pursue purity. When we look at verses 3 through 7 of Ephesians chapter 5, we say, but among you there must not even, there must, must be even, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse jo joking, which is out of place, but rather, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person such as a man is a, a, such a man is an idolater has any influence or inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient and therefore do not, do not be partners with them. So if we are truly practicing Christ's love, then we are, we're, gonna, we're not going to have a tolerance for sin. We're going to feel the same way about sin that Christ feels about it. That was the big enemy. That was why he died there on the cross, in order that our sin could be canceled out, that our sin could be paid for, and he expects us to have the same attitude towards sin that he has. And therefore, Paul lists two areas of sin. He's talking about, in this passage, the sexual and the verbal um, that are to be so far removed from the lifestyle of a believer, a believer that there shouldn't be any suspicion whatsoever that this, could, that this could be occurring in a believer's life. So let's look at the first. The first that he talks about is the sexual sin, uh, sexual immorality, and this would include any kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage relationship. In Paul's day, the Gentile world was corrupt, and um, they, would, they saw nothing wrong with prostitution, marriage infide infidelity, uh, unmarried people having sexual relations with each other or homosexuality. Uh, they had for centuries been, and that had uh, been an acceptable lifestyle for, for centuries for the Gentiles. But then the Bible's very clear about this, how God feels about this. He's, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, but you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. Run from sexual sin. No other sin is clearly, clearly affects, affects the body as this one does, for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and, is given, and, is, and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. I remember reading in Tony Evans' book, he was talking about sex is like a fire in the fireplace. When it's held in the fireplace, it's warm, it's comfortable, it's soothing. 
But when that, if that fire gets out of that fireplace, then it's going to cause some real trouble and damage and, and, and will be destructive. And so God created the sexual relationship to be between a man and a wife, confined to that marriage relationship. And in that context, it's warm and beautiful and soothing and enriching. But you take, it, but you take that fire out of that marriage relationship, it's going to bring some hurt and some destruction at some point, confusion. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 27 to 29 says, Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. But a man who commits adultery lacks judgment. Whoever does, does so destroys himself. Blows in disgrace are his lot, and the shame will never be wiped away. And then in verse 3, it also mentions impurity. And this, this would include thoughts, desires, and actions. This covers a broad scope of territory. And one of the most common plagues of our time is pornography. With it being so easily accessed today, there are so many who have been drawn into it as a sexual stronghold that they're experiencing uh, in, their, in their life. Pornography is derived from the Greek word pornea, which means uh, any kind of illicit sexual behavior. Our society is, has, bec- has really conditioned so many of us to see that it's the norm, that it's common. Um, these impurities should be commonplace and they are accepted, and we see that they are defended. They're defended. Uh, there are uh, those who oppose them are ridiculed, sometimes assaulted. Um, but then Paul talks about greed. He says greed, greed is a, another word for covetousness, and it may seem that covetousness is out of place uh, being mentioned along with sexual sins, but really it's the same expressions of, it's, it's different expressions of the same weakness. These are all expressions of uncontrolled appetite, desiring to gain some kind of satisfaction in something that does not belong to you. And it may be a lust for another man's wife or uh, a lust for another wife's husband. It may be a desire to stray outside of the marriage vows. It may, again, be the desire to satisfy with pornography. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 says, God says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet, covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. See, any person who is guilty of this kind of sexual covetousness is, is, um, is, not, gonna care what, is not gonna care what happens in somebody else's marriage. They're not gonna care the, about the pain that they bring into someone else's family. So Christians are to pursue purity in response to their love for Jesus Christ and no one should ever suspect that they would be guilty of sexual immorality or impurity or greed or covetousness. But not only are Christians to pursue purity in our, um, in, uh, in our actions, but also in our talk as well. And we see that in verse 4, Paul lists three kinds of communication that should, be named, should not be named among followers of Christ. Now listen, we're parking on these things, these lists, because it's in the text, all right? And we're not just, we're not, this is not just my opinion um, or my stand. This is according to the Word of God. This is, this is, um, this is um, what the text is saying. And also it's because our culture has made it so commonplace that we want to just breeze by it. And there's so many Christians who are being conformed to the culture. There's a, a conforming that is taking place in our culture, and you see that in so many Christians' lives and so many churches as well. To speak about it offends even Christians today, some Christians today. But let's look at these verbal sins that Paul talks about in verse 4. Nor should there be a obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, uh, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. So, Obscenity, uh, the world, the, uh, this would refer, reference uh, in, inappropriate uh, sexual comments or dirty jokes. Uh, the devil has a way of making things, making things commonplace to us if he can get us to laugh at them. And you can tell there's probably nothing that will reveal a person's heart 
more so than what they're willing to laugh at, what makes them laugh. Then there's foolish talk. This just refers to senseless, stupid talk that comes from the lips of a fool. There's coarse joking. This denotes a person who, uh, who has wit, uh, occupied with a filthy mind. It's actually a clever, dirty mind. And I'm sure you know people like that. That seems to be a major theme with so many of the comedians that we watch on television. You see such filth coming out of their mouth, nasty, filthy stuff, and it shouldn't be funny to us. It shouldn't be something that we laugh at. So Paul says that for the child of God, there, there shouldn't even be a hint of these things. Our laughing, our joking, our conversation, our humor should always bring glo- glory to God, joy joy to God and joy to the hearts of those people who are around us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Let those be the things that fill your mind. James chapter 3, beginning to verse 5 says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts. The whole person sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. With the tongue, we praise our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's image. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this shouldn't be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow out of the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water? So as Christians, we're commanded to bridle our tongue knowing that one day, the Scripture teaches, one day we're going to give an account for every word that's spoken. That's frightening. One day we're going to give an account for every word that is spoken that comes out of our mouth. So in fact, Paul launches some sobering words in verses 5 through 7 for those who deliberately and persistently live in sin. And that's what we're talking about today. That's the subject matter. That's the text today as we're talking about sin. There's no room for doubt as to God's attitude towards the immoral person. And they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. That's what the scripture says. Paul helps us to understand that. Verses 5 through 7. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person such uh, such a man as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient, and therefore do not be partners with them. You know, the seriousness of immorality should never be taken lightly, regardless of what the culture, regardless of what Hollywood is trying to portray. You know, you watch a movie and you see a guy meets girl and they're in bed that night, first date. Or you see, um, you see uh, I mean, the, the homosexuality uh, displayed on commercials, every commercial that you see on, on television. Um, as a Christian, we should so guard the gates of your mind and heart that you, would, uh, that, you would, uh, that you would not allow anyone to deceive you into believing that you can be a Christian and live an immoral life or to continue living an immoral life. Now, the truth of the matter is that there are Christians who fall into an immoral lifestyle, but you can't, you're going to be miserable with the Holy Spirit present in your life. If you're going to live in an immoral lifestyle, sinful lifestyle, and you're not willing to let it go, and you know that it's wrong, you're going to be miserable. If the Holy Spirit is present in your life, there's absolutely no way that you can fight against that. He's promised that he's never going to leave you or forsake you. So if you're going to live there, you're out of place. It's against the grain of your life. And 1 John chapter 5 says this this is love for God to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome for everyone born of of God overcomes the world. Listen, God doesn't make exceptions to his word and his standard. Don't think that you're a special case. I'm a special case. God understands me. Me and God have a, uh, we have an understanding. No, he's not going to make any exceptions. 
He's not going to lower his standard for, for any, any one of us. There is no excuse or argument to condone the sin that Paul has, uh, has discussed with us. And therefore, verse 7 states, don't partner up with these sins and those who participate in them. Instead, we should be imitators of the Father. You know, our greatest ambition as Christians is to protect the family name. You may be the only Bible that someone will ever read. You are either a harbor light or a warning signal. There's so many who are repelled from the cause of Christ, from, from Christ calling on their life because of Christians that they have seen that are no different from, from anyone else. The sins described here are those that are common among non-believers. These are common sins in our world today. All of them have a low mor- morality, but Paul is saying that that the child of God cannot habitually engage in these sins. Uh, Even the slightest engagement brings an agony to the soul. If there's not conviction, you're not saved. If you're living in sin and you know that you're living in sin, you're living in an immoral lifestyle and there's no conviction, there's no grief inside of you, then then one commentator says if you can get into sin and not be bothered by it, then you're not a child of God. There's going to be sore unrest if you've chosen to live an immoral lifestyle and you're, and you're a Christian. The only way to get over that is to come on home like the prodigal son. Go ahead and repent. Ask God forgiveness. He gives that beautiful opportunity. That's the price that he paid there on the cross to give us the opportunity to repent of the sin, to walk away from this sin, and to follow after him. And listen, when you are When you as a believer go to God to confess your sin, be specific. Don't bring a bundle and say, forgive me for all of my sins. You've got to be specific. Here's the sin of my attitude. Here's an action that that occurred in my life. Here are words that I have spoken. Here's here's some, 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 uh, here's, here, I repent of my thought life. I repent of the way that I think, my intentions, my motivations. But talk to him about the specific. And when we do that, when we talk to God in, these, uh, in our confession with specifics, then it renews our fellowship with him. Now, I'm saying that these are sins that believers drop into sometimes. Uh, when they do, they're to confess them to God, not try to hide them or justify them. I've known many who come into the Christian life, they do good for a little while, but then they mess up. And they fall a couple of times and they think that there's no hope for them and they turn and they run away. That's the last thing you need to do. Man, if you mess up, you turn around, you come home like the prodigal son and say, God, I just ask you to forgive me. You paid this price on the cross. You spent so much time getting me to where I am, to where I have been, and I just want to come to you and I want to ask that you would forgive me. And that's the beauty of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But a child of God can't confess a sin and then continue to live in that sin. That's a dead giveaway that that person is not a child of God. Don't play games with him. If you're going to confess your sin, knowing that you are planning on doing that again, don't play games with God. He knows that. He sees through it all. But if you're a child of God and you do these things unrepentant, God will chasten you. He'll take some of us to the woodshed periodically. But if he doesn't chasten you, then that's a bad sign too because it means you're not a child of God. He doesn't spank somebody else's kid. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 8, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you've forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what a son is not what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. So, getting back to what Paul started talking about, and that is that we are to be imitators. We are to be imitators of God, uh, imitate our, our loving heavenly Father, and we do that by the practice um, to, by practicing God's love through sacrifice and forgiveness, and then also pursuing purity in our own personal lives. We carry the family name, and that's very, very important. Carry the family name of Christianity. 
And what people read in our life can change the way they think about God. Again, you may be the only Bible that someone around you will ever read. You are probably the best Christian that someone around you knows. So it's up to us to represent Christ, be imitators of Christ, because it's by his love that people are attracted. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. But it's only true if we learn to imitate God, the God that we say that we love. There was a great battle in the heat of a bloody battle. A young soldier turned. He ran. He was, he was uh, in, in trembling fear. And as he approached the rear flanks of the army, he passed by. He was stopped by an officer, a general that was on horseback. And in a thunderous tone, that officer, that general commanded that he explain his actions. And the boy had no, no recourse except to say that he was afraid. And that general said, soldier, what is your name? And the young soldier said, sir, my name is Alexander. And the general on the horse said, my name also is Alexander. I'm Alexander the Great. And I implore you to either change your actions or you change your name. How many of us, how many of us would be guilty of that in the presence of God? If, if God were to speak to you about the way that you're living right now, would he say that to you? Change your actions or change your name. For goodness sake, don't tell anybody that you're a Christian. If you're living like the rest of the world, if you're just like everybody else, don't carry on with that name of Christian because we, sometimes we do more harm than we do good. We're to be imitators of the God that we love. You know, there's, to compromise is betrayal. To lock up with sin that we know Jesus died to cancel out. It's like your, your spouse befriending your worst enemy. It's a betrayal. Our attitude towards sin is to be the same attitude that God has towards sin. Doesn't mean we'll be perfect. Doesn't mean we'll be without. The Bible says if a person says they're without sin, the truth is not in them. How much sin is too much sin? Psalm 66, 18 says if I harbor it, if I let it park there, if I know it's there, if I harbor sin in my heart, God won't hear my prayers. So it's when you know, when God convicts you of that sin, that's when we have to come to him as a child saying, I, I want to confess my sin to you. I want to be obedient to you. I want you to bless me. You know, there probably needs to be some confession here today. I think this is a message in some way or another would hit home with each and every one of us. Um, maybe some think you're saved, but you're not. You've been in church for a long time. You prayed that sinner's prayer, but nothing ever changed in your life. Listen to me. You can't invite the person, the creator of the universe, your creator, the person of the Holy Spirit into your life and remain the same. You can't. You can't remain the same. There's going to be a change, a change from the inside. You can't grab hold of 20,000 volts of electric current and remain the same. Something's going to change. You can't invite the creator of the world to come into your life and remain the same person. So there may be some here today who think you're saved and you're not. You need to go back to the Lord and make sure that you drive down that stake properly. Maybe others who have experienced, the, you're experiencing the chastening of God. You're a Christian, you're compromised, you're living in sin, and, he, and you're experiencing the chastening of God, but you haven't connected the dots. Things not going, going so well in your life. Sometimes, sometimes it's a matter of God refining us and building us up um, and then, but sometimes it's a chastening that is taking place in our life and God is leading us, drawing us as children of his into an attitude of repentance. I want to ask that, I don't know if Michael's available right now, kind of the spur of the moment here, at the, but if the music, musicians would come to the stage right now and just play a little under, um, undercurrent music, I'm just going to ask that you would cl close your eyes did you just close your eyes? Did you bow your head? What, what thought has gone through your mind that needs to be corrected? 
What sin have you experienced or are you experiencing in your life? Is there something that you're holding on to? Is there unforgiveness? You're saying, I just can't. This person violated me. I, I can't let go of this. Or maybe it's a stronghold that has developed in your life, a stronghold of pornography, sexual sin. And you've got to come to the Lord and say, I've got to confess this to you because I'm not going to experience your blessing without. I need to get things right. The fellowship, my fellowship with you has been broken. Do you want it back? Well, go before the Lord just for a few moments here today. Go before the Lord right now and just do business with him. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a privilege. Heavenly Father, perhaps you've started something in some person or many of our lives today. Holy Spirit, with your word being spoken, perhaps you've pointed out some things we didn't even know were there. But I pray that you'd give us the courage as Christians to be more concerned about the family name, to be more concerned about your reputation, to be more concerned about bringing joy and honor to you rather than a temporary pleasure to ourselves. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would work in our lives and lure us to higher ground, cause us to be somebody that we've never been before. Holy Spirit, convict us where there is a, a need for conviction, where you need to make some changes in our life. And I pray that there, you'd resurrect some in their spiritual condition today. But, Father, if there are some who are still spiritually dead, and theirs has been nothing but religion, but nothing really changed in their life. I pray that today, today, right now, that you would reveal that to them, that you would put that hurt in their heart, in their gut, here this morning, and that they would be determined that they want to get things right. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, whatever decision that you have made, if you've made any decisions, today. I'm going to be standing here at the front at the end of the service. There'll be a couple of other pastors there as well. Just help, let us, let us help you with this. Let us pray for you through this. And if you've just, if you realize that, you know, I need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I belong, that I'm a child of God, let us help you with that here this morning.